Hi, this is Dr. Cook, your Chem 240 instructor. Let's take a look at the next video. In this video, I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the properties of alkenes and alkynes. As we discussed in Chapter 1 about hybridization of carbon and other atoms, when we have the sp2 hybridization state, we have a carbon that has a p orbital that's unhybridized, along with three identical hybrid orbitals that make up the three sp2 orbitals. And these p orbitals, when you have carbons that are adjacent overlapping, those p orbitals form the basis of a pi bond. That is a bond where you can see above and below the plane of the molecule that there's overlap and sharing of electrons. In between the two carbons, there's a sigma bond in the middle, and then there are sigma bonds uh, to each of the hydrogens, and all of those define a plane. So this is a planar flat molecule where the pi system, or the pi bond, is orthogonal or 90 degrees apart from that. In an sp2 hybridized alkene compound, what we have are bond angles that are about 120 degrees. You'll notice that between the hydrogens it's slightly less because the hydrogens are smaller than the carbon, and between the bond between CH and CC it's slightly larger because of the size of the carbon making that bond a little bit larger, but roughly about 120 degree bond angles. And we can see from the electron density map that most of the electron density of the pi bond is in between the two carbons right at the p orbital. So you can see the red areas and that would be the same below as well. Um, when we talk about reactions in the next chapter, it is the pi bond which is the source of most reactivity for alkenes and alkynes because that's where the electron density is and a side-to-side -side overlap or a pi bond is a weaker bond than a end-to-end -end overlap or a sigma bond. Well, the structure of alkynes is very similar with the exception that the sp hybridized carbon leaves two p orbitals unhybridized in which to form an additional bond from a side-to-side -side overlap and those are orthogonal or 90 degrees apart one in this case in the up and down direction and one coming out and going back from the plane of the board so you can see those two different orbitals now are those two different pi bonds between a carbon of an alkyne a carbon carbon of an alkyne um, and notice the shape is 180 degree bond angles, it's a linear molecule, and all the electron density resides in a, basically a cylinder for the pi bonds around those uh, two carbons. Well, as we talked about in the previous chapter, when you have molecules which have restricted rotation, and we've seen that in ring compounds because of the ends of the carbon chains are attached together that it restricts the rotation, that we can have stereoisomers occur because groups that are substituents on the top face of the ring versus the bottom face of the ring cannot interconvert. We see a similar situation when we have alkenes or pi bonds. So in the case of a, a pi bond as shown here for an alkene, in order for there to be rotation between the carbon-carbon bonds, you would have to actually break the overlap or break the pi bond in order to achieve a rotation. And because of this, pi bonds are rigid, they do not rotate, and that creates a situation where we have reduced flexibility of the molecule as compared to alkanes. This restricted rotation about a double bond allows for stereoisomers to occur, and that occurs when you have substitution on either end of a double bond, and they're either on the same side or opposite sides. So in order to explain that a little bit more, let's take a look at some of the constitutional isomers of butene. So in this case, I've drawn but1-ene. That is a molecule with a four carbon chain where the double bond starts at the number one carbon and extends to the number two carbon. So this one refers to the starting position of the double bond. Uh, this is the correct IUPAC name. However, traditionally for many, many years, people have just used one butene, that one in front, indicating the position of the double bond as well. We'll talk about naming a little bit more in detail later. But this constitutional isomer, 1-butene, has a structure like this. If you look at the double bond, on this side there's two hydrogens, and on this side there's a hydrogen and an alkyl group. And the molecule would be identical if we were to switch either of those two groups or switch either of those two groups, the same molecule, because we have two of the same things on one side. Another constitutional isomer occurs when you take say the CH3 group off of the end and put it onto this carbon here and replacing that hydrogen. Moving, switching the CH3 and that hydrogen would give you 2-methyl propene.
propene because it's a three carbon chain with a methyl group off of the two carbon. There are no possible isomers. These two groups are identical and these two groups are identical. So um, this is a different constitutional isomer from that one. We have changed the bonds and the atoms that are bonded to each other. Another constitutional isomer occurs when we take the double bond and move it to a different position in the chain. So if we go from one butene or but one ene to two butene, but two ene, where the double bond starts on the number two carbon and extends to the number three carbon, so it's between two and three. Now this is a different constitutional isomer. We've changed the position of bonds. We've changed which carbons are sp2 hybridized and which carbons are sp3 hybridized in that chain as compared to that one. So those are not the same. Now, however, when we take a close look at this molecule, we have a double bond here and we have a hydrogen on, and a methyl group on the left side. We have a hydrogen and a methyl group on the right side. And because there is no rotation about the carbon-carbon bond because the double bond restricts it, that molecule is a different molecule where hydrogens are both on the same side and the methyl groups are on the same side. So the structure I've drawn on the right is simply taking this methyl group and this hydrogen and switching their positions. Now this CH3 is still bonded to that carbon 2 or 3 and this CH3 is still bonded to carbon 3 if we're numbering in this direction. But they are fixed in space and so they are different stereoisomers. They are all bonded to the same atoms but they're oriented differently in three dimensions and they don't interconvert because if you take this molecule on the right and slide it over and try to line it up on the molecule on the left, there's no way you can position that molecule where all the atoms match up in exactly the same places. So those are stereoisomers, and we use the same terminology that we used in ring compounds to indicate the stereochemistry of those groups. That is, if the groups off of the double bond are op opposite sides as you go across from one side to the other, we call that the trans compound, and if they're on the same side, that is the cis compound. It is important to recognize that those positions also are in different steric environments when you have groups which are larger than a hydrogen. So if we take this 2-butene molecule and we look at the cis compound and compare it to the trans compound, and I've highlighted the methyl groups there with yellow balls to show a little bit more of their size, here on the left they are getting closer together. So there's some steric strain or steric repulsion occurring at these positions. However, if you look at the trans isomer, those groups are farther apart. And so what they're next to is a smaller hydrogen. So there's, there's more space available for them and there's less steric strain. So because of that, the trans isomer is less crowded, it's lower in energy, and we can see that if we carry out a chemical reaction that actually allows the equilibration or the isomerization of cis to trans and back and forth, we see that the equilibrium ratio lies more towards the side of the lower energy species than the higher energy species. Well, the stereochemistry of alkenes affects the shape of the molecule and does have impacts in terms of biological mechanisms. For example, uh, we take a look at this molecule beta carotene, which is a molecule that comes from carrots. And we eat this molecule and when it's metabolized by our body, it's basically uh, cut in half and produces what we call vitamin A, which has an alcohol group on the end. But you'll notice all of the double bonds in beta carotene and the double bonds that exist in the molecule shown here. And if you look down this longest chain of double bonds, in this orientation where the groups along the chain are all opposite sides from each other or trans to each other, you get this linear chain that's very similar in structure and shape to linear alkanes in their most stable conformation, which is the fully extended staggered position or orientation. This vitamin A is further metabolized into a molecule we call transretinal. And retinal, it's not that important, but it has an aldehyde functionality at the end. But what is important is that this is embedded in a protein in the retina of your eyeball. And one particular double bond, when it absorbs a photon of light, when light hits this molecule, this double bond in the center isomerizes from the trans isomer opposite sides. I'll write the hydrogens in here for some clarity. Let me clean this up. Show the hydrogens in here for clarity so you see why that's the trans isomer. Uh, and when light is absorbed by that molecule, that double bond undergoes an isomerization to the cis isomer. And I'll draw the hydrogens in here to illustrate that. 
when we produce cis-retinal, that causes a change or a bending or a kinking in that molecule. That affects the structure of the protein that it's bound in, and that does a signaling pathway which tells your brain that light has been absorbed. So this cis-trans isomerization is very critical for our ability to be able to see. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit more about naming alkanes.